Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's nice to have everyone here. Um, let me say thanks to our sponsors at Rolls-Royce for making our Military Strategy Forum series possible and extend my sincere gratitude to Admiral Ruffhead for coming to talk with us this morning. Um, Admiral Ruffhead has commanded about, I was trying to count, I can't count that high. I don't have enough fingers and toes for all the things you've commanded. <laughs> um, and has, I, I, pardon the pun, won a boatload of commendations, medals, and, rec and uh, commendations for all of the wonderful things he has done. I got to know him when he was the Chief of Legislative Affairs for the Navy, one of his uh, other and numerous very prestigious uh, shore assignments. And for the last four years, he has been leading the Navy and I think uh, widely seen as having done an exceptional job in setting a course for the Navy and both sort of consolidating and clarifying uh, their vision up till now and then setting forth a view for where they need to go in the future. And that's only gonna become more important as we uh, get into a little bit tighter fiscal climbs, which I'm sure will come up today. So let me um, get out of the way, but again, thank you so much for coming and we're looking forward to your remarks. Thanks, thank you. Uh, video people be bothered if I work from the floor and move around? Okay. Well, I think that's what I'll do. I, I tend to be a little bit more comfortable doing that and then when we get to the, is this on by the way or not? No? It is, okay, good. Uh, when we get to the questions and answers, I kind of prefer the op the ability to uh, to get a little closer because my hearing is not where it used to be, as some of my retired colleagues in the in the front know. But I really do appreciate the opportunity to come and just spend some time and talk a bit about the Navy, about the environment that um, that we are in and that we will likely to be in for the for the foreseeable future. And I really appreciate Maren the opportunity to do this. Last time was in October of 2009, uh, as my records show. It was a little different environment back then. Um, I think that it's clear that the budget, uh, budgetary environment was not the same as it is or will likely be in the future. But um, I will also tell you that the, the time has flown by and the Navy has been extraordinarily busy uh, during that period of time. Um, in, in, uh, I'm going to just drop back a little bit to set the stage uh, for how uh, things are going and, and how I see that future. As many of you uh, know, we uh, issued a maritime strategy uh, about three and a half years ago with the uh, Coast Guard and with the Marine Corps and uh, have held pretty true to that, I believe. Uh, I have found it extraordinarily useful as I've engaged internationally and as we have built this idea of the Global Maritime Partnership, a uh, data point there uh, that I think is not insignificant. Uh, every two years that we pull together the navies of the world at our War College in Newport. Uh, in 2007, uh, we had 67 countries that came to Newport. In 2009, we had 102 countries come. Uh, that is not an insignificant gathering, but I think it shows uh, that there is a need for the navies uh, to come together, for maritime forces to come together, because we all have an interest in how things are moving on the planet, uh, the trade, the resources, and it really has allowed us to frame that, that discussion about global maritime partnerships quite well. I've also found it very helpful not just uh, inside the world in which I live here in Washington, uh, but also as we engage uh, with others on being able to talk about the capabilities that the Navy needs in the context of that strategy. And basically it said that we would be uh, a global force, uh, that we would be forward, uh, that we would be a force for deterrence, uh, and many folks would immediately think about our, our uh, leg of the nuclear triad, our ballistic missile submarines. Uh, important to be sure, but I can argue that two carriers in the North Arabian Sea, uh, that's deterrence as well. Um, so forward global deterrent force, but also to be able to exercise um, and, and project power. 
uh, to be able to control the sea, uh, kind of the, 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 the fundamental dimensions of what the Navy is and what navies are. Uh, but then in the strategy, we also added in two more. Uh, maritime security, because we saw a compelling need for uh, the, 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 the partnerships, the structures, the ability to share information uh, to enhance the maritime security uh, of, the, of the planet. And then we also added um, uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster response. Disaster response, really nothing new for navies. Uh, we responded to disasters, and people have been doing that from the first time they ever went to sea. Um, but the humanitarian assistance is uh, more proactive. Uh, it really found its, its true genesis in the, in the aftermath of the tsunami of 2004, when although we responded quite well and brought a lot of relief to a very, very wide area of devastation, we realized that if we had uh, more proactive relationships, if we worked together, if we had better partnerships with non-governmental organizations uh, that we could even do the disaster response better. So that's what the strategy called for. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, I happened to be uh, with a group not unlike uh, the one here today, and, and I was asked the question, uh, is the strategy still valid? Are you going to change it? it was a, the timing of it was pretty interesting because at that time I knew that we were going into Libya, but it was not out in the public domain. And so when I thought about that question, I, I just thought to myself, is the strategy valid and what is it that we're doing today? The deterrent force was out on patrol. Uh, we were globally deployed, as we are on any day. About 40% of the Navy ships, submarines, and aircraft are deployed on any given day, which is a pretty high number uh, as you have to manage that rotation. Um, and uh, we had the ships and submarines positioned off Libya ready to project power. Uh, so there are three of the capabilities that, that, that we talked about. Um, we were basically doing sea control in that area as we were monitoring that which was uh, operating in the, in the Gulf of Sirte. And, the, and the, along the Libyan coastline, so there's four. Uh, if you moved a little farther to the east and south, we, with 14 other countries, were doing counter piracy operations. It's maritime security. Um, and at that same time, we were a couple of days into the humanitarian assistance into Japan. And so it, it was a pretty good spread of what the Navy uh, does, what we said we needed to be able to do, and most importantly, I think, what the Navy continues to deliver on uh, every day. Uh, we do that with a force that today is 285 ships, the smallest Navy that this nation has had since 1916. I think our global responsibilities weren't quite what they, uh, or what they are today. Uh, there are 328 uh, sailors, uh, 328,000 sailors in the Navy, active sailors about 65,000 reserve, and about 160,000 Navy civilians. On any given day, about 65,000 of those sailors will be deployed, uh, and that's the pace that we keep working. We continue to maintain about 12 or 13,000 sailors in Afghanistan um, as, as, as part of the forces there. Uh, we have construction battalions, explosive ordnance disposal. Of course, our SEALs uh, are there and uh, uh, continue to be a very high-end force that can do great work when called upon to do so. Um, and then we have changed how we deploy our people in what we call individual augmentees, uh, good people, good sailors who go forward and are assigned in places uh, in support of the ground forces where there might not be that resource in the ground force uh, to accomplish that job. And we've been doing that now for about nine years. Uh, and that pace has, has continued on. I think as I look back over uh, the, the time that I've had the privilege of being able to do what I do, uh, it's, been a, it's been a pretty interesting uh, four years. Uh, and, uh, and there have been a lot of changes. There have clearly been demands for the Navy 
uh, and we have answered those demands uh, at every turn. But um, to, to talk a little bit about uh, of the future and not necessarily things such as current readiness, uh, one of the things that I get to do is to look into that future and try to uh, design or divine the type of Navy that the nation will need in that future. Uh, when I came into the position, it was clear to me that those of you who follow uh, the defense industry, the defense budgets, you know that it's a pretty nice sine curve that moves up and down. And, and my sense was that we had been following an inflated high or we had been riding an inflated high uh, for quite a while. And that on my watch, uh, it would uh, likely be uh, the point where I would push that stick forward and we'd start to nose over. And so what we tried to do as we looked to that future was to get as much stability uh, in our programs as we possibly could. And I think we've done a fairly good job in doing that. Uh, if you look at our submarine force, uh, this year we moved to two Virginia-class submarines a year. We got the price down to where we said we would get it down to so that we could begin that uh, two submarines a year. We continue in cooperation with our UK allies uh, to, def to design uh, the next strategic deterrent, the Ohio replacement. And so the submarine programs are moving along. If you look at the surface ships that the Navy will be building, we, uh, before Christmas, got the green light to go ahead and do a block buy of 20 littoral combat ships. Uh, it took about three years to get that program in a place where we had the confidence uh, to be able to get that sort of uh, an agreement with Congress. And so we have opted to go with both variants of that ship. Two shipyards will be producing uh, and we'll end up with, uh, uh, with 20 of those in that, in that block by. We've restarted the DDG-51 line because that's the, the, the ship that is really going to be the workhorse for ballistic missile defense and integrated air and missile defense. Uh, the DDG-1000, in my mind, was not that ship, and for that reason, that's why we truncated it to restart the DDG-51. We uh, are also building a joint high-speed vessel, and in this past year, the Army, who also was in the joint high-speed vessel program, uh, transferred all of the ships to the Navy, and we will operate it as one fleet, which I think is a much more efficient way to do business. We also are building something called a mobile logistics platform, which, uh, which adds to the sea base and the ability to move things from sea to shore uh, in greater quantities and, and more effectively. We continue to build amphibious ships, both the uh, LHAs and then also uh, the LPD-17 that I believe we now have gotten some of the initial quality problems uh, sorted out and, and, and those ships are going to be uh, extremely helpful, uh, and I know the Marines like them very much, and, uh, and that means a lot to us. Uh, but I think the area that probably is the most uh, significant uh, and where we're really renewing ourselves is in naval aviation. Uh, if I was a young person coming into the Navy today, uh, going into aviation, I'd be pretty excited. Uh, if you look at what we're doing, every single line is new. Uh, whether it's the Joint Strike Fighter, where our Charlie variant is down at Patuxent River testing well, uh, or the, the additional Super Hornets that we purchased to fare in that, that, that gap that we have in Strike Fighters, um, the addition of four more squadrons of electronic attack that has been pushed to us, um, those are going to be in production and played very well uh, in the Libyan operation. Uh, they were flying combat missions in Iraq. We moved them, we recovered from a combat mission in Iraq, moved them to Aviano, Italy, and they launched on a combat mission into Libya within 47 hours. Uh, that's agility, flexibility, and great capability that allows you to go in and break down those air defense systems if you want to be able to operate with impunity. Uh, the P-8, the replacement for the P-3, is in test at Patuxent River. Two new helicopter lines, the 60 Sierra, the 60 Romeo, are in production and deployed. Uh, we have three unmanned vehicles, uh, aerial uh, vehicles, uh, that are flying. Uh, the Fire Scout, our unmanned helicopter, 
uh, is deployed on a frigate operated in, uh, in the east coast of Africa in support of our SEALs and is now moving into the Mediterranean. Uh, we've also pushed some of those fire scouts to Afghanistan uh, for the Army to use. Uh, we're flying our version of the Global Hawk that we call BAMS, Broad Area Maritime Surveillance System. Um, and we have the production line going on that. Uh, and then a couple of months ago, we flew the carrier unmanned aircraft, which is a flying wing, which is technologically something quite significant as you bring a, a, a configuration like that uh, over what is a little bit of a burble behind an aircraft carrier. And that airplane has flown extraordinarily well. Uh, the control system is in a uh, Hornet as a surrogate and also in a King Air, and we're starting to do the tests around the aircraft carrier now. And our focus on the UAVs was really to uh, focus on those aircraft that operated from the sea. Early on, we had been pulled into flying predators and things like that. Um, that's not our forte, and so we made the decision that we were going after sea-based UAVs. I think one of the other areas that we moved fairly boldly in in the last couple of years was in the area that we're calling information dominance. Uh, since the last time I was here, uh, we basically have reorganized ourselves where we combined the Directorate for Intelligence and the Directorate for Command and, Com and, Command and Control into one Directorate for Information Dominance. We've moved all of our unmanned systems in there, and we have moved all of our, our what we call information dominance to include cyber systems into this new structure. And for the first time, we've been able to look across the Navy without having to deal with the individual interests of what I call the tribes um, of surface aviation and, and uh, submarines in order to make good decisions that are in the best interest of the Navy and fit best into the joint force. Uh, and that really facilitated a lot of the work that we did with the Air Force in the air-sea battle. But we had already made that move before uh, we got into air-sea battle. At the same time, we reactivated the U.S. 10th Fleet. Uh, that fleet was, in a, it was uh, uh, active in the Second World War, uh, and it was the fleet that uh, one of my predecessors used to go after the U-boat threat in the Atlantic. Uh, so with the creation of the 10th Fleet, who that now has global responsibilities for cyber operations, uh, we're able to, to deal in that environment on a global basis as opposed to the way things have normally been designed within the military to be uh, more regionally focused. And then the third component of information dominance is to take all of those individuals that either sense the information, analyze the information, move the information, or fix that which it rides on. Um, we have put them into a core. We manage them as a core. And when we do it, it's 45,000 people. We cross detail or cross assign uh, individuals. Uh, you know, no longer is an intel officer only going to be available uh, to command and operate at, at intelligence facilities. They may command uh, a cyber facility, or they may uh, command an operation center somewhere. But we're managing it as a core, and we can see the awareness of this world of information improve within the Navy. As in all things, I think that, you know, we can talk about the ships, the airplanes, the submarines, and, uh, and you can really become captured by that. But the fact of the matter is that it's all about the people. They're the ones that make it all work. Uh, and I would say that those are the areas that today we are the most challenged in because uh, we face a retention problem in the Navy. And when I say that to some of my predecessors, they rub their chin and they say, I had a retention problem too, I know what you're going through. And I say, no, you don't. Um, because my retention problem is I have too many people in the Navy. In fact, this summer, we are going to separate 3,000 young men and women before the time that they wanted to leave. Um, and we're going to be doing the same for some of our commanders and captains because we have too many people. Uh, so we're, we're going to go through that process. It's also been a time uh, where we've, I, I think, made some uh, fundamental changes uh, that are very positive for the Navy, and I'd say very positive for the country. We are in the process now of the first young women 
who will be going to submarine duty are now in submarine school. Uh, they have been through the nuclear power training, which is really nothing new because they've been going to our nuclear aircraft carriers for some time. But they're on their way through submarine school and they'll report aboard their first submarines here in the fall. And then, of course, one of the things that all of the services have been doing is we've been leading our way through uh, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And the training for that has gone extraordinarily well. Uh, we are at very high levels of completion. There's nothing that has surprised, uh, and I think we're moving into that period uh, where we're getting very close uh, for me to be able to make my recommendation that we'll then follow the legislative process uh, f that, will, that will repeal uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, the budgetary environment that we're in is clearly, um, uh, I won't say what we expected. We expected it to come down. I'm not sure that, that we had the insight um, uh, to, to be able to see just how pressurized this budgetary environment would be. Uh, last year in the Navy, we took a good look at how we could extract some efficiencies from our programs. Uh, we initially set a target of about $24 billion. Uh, we ended up at the end of the day uh, taking out $28 billion and moving those efficiencies back into uh, our programs and into our people. We moved uh, around 6,800 sailors from shore activities and got them back into the operational forces. Uh, a few years ago, we had done a, something that we called optimal manning. We optimized too much and we were paying the price for that. Uh, so we bought those people back and we're gonna put those back out into the operational forces. Uh, we also put a lot of money back into procurement. Not only in some of the traditional systems we've increased, we bought five more ships, we increased the number of aircraft that we purchased uh, uh, you know, to a fairly significant number. And then a lot of the money that we took we put into information dominance, focused largely on what many people call the anti-access area denial capabilities that we're going to need. And invariably, folks will say, well, you're talking about China. But my view is that the anti-access area denial is, is, you know, there may be some geographic areas where it may be more pressing. But in point of fact, with the way that advanced systems proliferate around the world today, um, you are going to be faced with anti-access capabilities in many, many places where we may choose to operate. Um, and so that's where a lot of our investments went. And I'm pleased with, uh, with how we've been able to pull a lot of things earlier in our program so that we can then employ those globally. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there. I burned up about 25 minutes. And I'd really like to get to your questions more than anything else. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Sorry, can you wait for the mic if we, so we capture it on video? Thank you. Hi, Dave Fulgham with Aviation Week. Uh, there's a lot of talk that is part of the budget reorganization that they're going to ask you to take a look at roles and missions. And I'm particularly interested in, in what you think you may pick up and lose, uh, particularly in the aviation wing. Um, it looks like you've got standoff jamming pretty well locked up. Uh, I want to see what else you, again, may want to keep and give up. Yeah. If pressed. Well, the um, I think as you look at the types of capabilities that we bring, and the point that I would make about our aviation uh, highly optimized to coming from the sea, uh, we have the advantage, I believe, of operating from sovereign airfields anywhere we want to. Um, we don't have to ask permission to, um, to have that airfield where we need it to be. Uh, and oh, by the way, they're called aircraft carriers. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we avoid a lot of the overflight issues. But as we looked at the aviation capabilities that, that we needed and the lines that we have laid in, and, and by the way, all of the things that I talked about 
in, whether it's in the submarine area, the, sh the ship area, or aviation, you can touch today. Uh, which is a good position to be in as opposed to trying to sell a PowerPoint slide uh, and crossing the valley of death to get something started. Um, but if you look at, at what, what we're doing with the strike capability, I think that we have uh, a, a proven strike capability that uh, comes from the carriers in the, in the current form that we have. You mentioned the uh, electronic attack that, that I, I believe will continue to be uh, very important in any kind of an anti-access, and, and as we found, uh, most of our electronic attack uh, has been employed recently in, in counter, uh, excuse me, radio-controlled improvised explosive devices. I mean, so we've adapted that capability to to the fight that we're in. The um, the importance of uh, the P8 program uh, is really to address the the submarine developments that are occurring globally. Uh, submarines are still selling uh, and they're getting quieter and the ability to be out over the water to, to localize those submarines will continue to be important. The helicopter, the Romeo, is really optimized also for anti-submarine warfare. And then, of course, the Sierra is great for uh, supporting our, our special operations forces there. I think in the case of the uh, unmanned uh, systems, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles that we have. Uh, the Fire Scout is proving to be uh, rather good in ISR, and we are looking to arm that here shortly. Um, the initial reports from the SEALs is that they like that, uh, that capability quite a bit. Uh, the BAMS allows us to do surveillance uh, at, for long periods of time in areas that that we want to be able to uh, uh, just have something up there. You know, I call UAVs are great for the dull and dangerous. And so if you want to have somebody staring at something for 20 hours, a UAV is probably the way to do that. Uh, and then for me, the, the development of the, of the UCAS really will allow us to begin to lay track uh, for anti-access environments uh, in the future. And, uh, and so I think in the aviation area, we have some, we've covered down on, on the capabilities uh, that we need uh, that have proven to be valuable to not only the Navy, but to the Joint Force. So we'll see where the discussions take us. Yes, ma'am. We're taking a look at that. Will it be an EP-8? Will it be a, a BAMS? Or will it be a hybrid of the two? And that's what we're looking at. Uh, thank you, Admiral. Sandra Arwen with National Defense. Um, you talked about having to let people go um, beginning this year because of affordability issues. Um, Not affordability issues. The, the reason that we are letting people go is because they are not leaving the Navy on the projected rate that they normally do. Okay. Retention is extraordinarily high, and people are in the Navy to fill specific jobs. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as if... Um, I can just keep people because I want to keep people. They're sized for the jobs. And what has happened is that the normal retention trends uh, are, um, uh, are extraordinarily higher than they have ever been. And the predictions that we had for what the force would be like are not bearing up. So I guess my question has to do with the affordability of the all-volunteer force. I mean, there's there's a lot of talk now that it is becoming unaffordable. Would you agree with that? And, and if so, would you support changes in the compensation programs to make the, f the force more affordable in the future? Yep, thank you. Um, I think that it is important to look at, um, at the cost of manpower. It, it is clearly uh, the cost that inflates the most. If, if I look at all of the portfolios, whether it's procurement, manpower, operations, uh, manpower inflates at around 45 to 4.7% uh, because of pay, medical, other benefits. Um, the others are right around the 3% range. So uh, I think we do have to look at it. I think you've seen where we have advocated for changes to our health care system. 
uh, to be able to offset some of the costs that we absorb uh, within our budget. So I think we, we should do that. Uh, I've been doing some personal research on some of the uh, how we got to where we are. Uh, I think it's interesting when you look at things like the Gates report, and this is not current Secretary Gates, this is the Gates report from the early 70s that really was the genesis of the all-volunteer force. Uh, it's interesting to see how they saw that future, what they thought needed to be done, some of which we did, some of which we didn't, and that which we didn't we're paying for today, uh, particularly in, in, in terms of uh, retirement programs uh, and, and some of the thoughts that they had back then. And I think it is important uh, because I would be the first one to say that in the environments in which we operate today, the types of things that we operate, um, to, to, to think that we could go back to a conscript force where someone comes in and serves for a year or two years, um, there are very few places uh, where, where I think we could afford to do that. That said, we have to live within our means and we have to look at how big that force is, what the compensation is, and, and I think that's where we have to go. But I think it has to be done responsibly. Uh, I believe it has to be uh, done uh, in a way that, um, that, that we can bring all of those who are interested in this together and have a, have a reasonable discussion about it. Uh, what tends to happen is uh, the, the the barriers start getting set early, and you really don't have a lot of room to maneuver to be able to have the discussions that I think are important um, as, as we try to, to think into this future. Go in the back back here. Daniel Lippman from McClatchy Newspapers. Um, has the government crackdown in Bahrain affected the Fifth Fleet's like operations in any way? And do you worry that um, the government's actions there put um, you guys in like a stitch, sticky situation in which you worry about giving like legitimacy or what, what, what do you, what's the, your take on that? It has not that? affected uh, our operations in any way. Uh, none of the disorder uh, was, was targeted at, at uh, Fifth Fleet or at our people who live there and continue to live there. Um, and uh, and, I, and I, I would say that, that uh, command that we have in Bahrain is, is, is very important to the region and how we, uh, not just for the U.S. Navy, but all of the coalition activity we have, how important it is. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that, that the dialogue is ongoing, uh, but in no way did it affect our operations. I'm going to start here. Um, Caitlin Garner with BAE Systems. I just wanted to get your opinion about the possibility of forming private navies to escort merchant ships. Um, I guess if the shippers want to pay for it, it'll be up to them. I mean, um, I, you know, the, uh, the work that we're doing with the other countries uh, and the employment of the best practices, I think, has, has been very helpful. Uh, Many of you have heard me say before that until you resolve the issue ashore, um, you can have private navies, you can have professional navies, um, you can have armed guards. Uh, they will still be out there until you get to the criminal business that's taking place ashore. Um, and to be able to hold those accountable um, through a legal system uh, that can get in and, and, uh, and shut the businesses down. I hold up Southeast Asia as an example where that worked, uh, where, where piracy essentially was, was brought to a halt with a very effective maritime scheme, but the advantage that they had there was that they had legitimate law enforcement in Indonesia and Malaysia, of course Singapore and, and Thailand, and they were able to work it from both, uh, both sides. And that's what's going to solve the problem ashore. I mean, we could throw a lot more ships and folks and everything out there, but you're patrolling an area four times the size of Texas. Um, you've got to get the problem ashore. That's where pirates live. That's where they move their money. That's where they, uh, they, they uh, base from. Otto. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Otto Chrysler, Power Magazine. You mentioned the joint high-speed vessel. 
big change over from the fact that you were going to split that uh, fleet with the Army, that they would be operating, buying and operating some of them. Now you're going to be buying and operating all of them. What does that do to your procurement budget and you know, manpower and everything to, uh, and cost to run those ships? And, and how are you going to use them? Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm pleased with how the arrangement was made with the transfer. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a very generous man, but I'm a practical man. And uh, I made sure that there was a, uh, the appropriate exchanges took place as, as we did that deal. Uh, I believe that our uh, model with which we operate high-speed vessels and the Maritime Sea Lift Command is a, is a very efficient one, and I, and I think others saw that. Uh, and, and really, the demand for those is coming from uh, the combatant commanders. Uh, they are very good in providing fast lift in areas where we need it, you know, dispersed around the world. Um, and they're also very good in theater security cooperation uh, activities because they are uh, not very expensive to operate. They have shallow draft. You can put a lot on them, and you can get into places that uh, some of the larger ships can't get into. And so that's how we'll do it. Right. The, there are, when, whenever we do something like that, uh, there are transfers that take place within the services. And so I'm very pleased with how we've set this deal up. That there was a transfer between us and the Army on that, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, Admiral, for your uh, remarks today. My name is David Sherrington from Battelle. I'd be interested to hear uh, your comments on, on where you think uh, Unmanned undersea systems will, will, will work for the Navy in the near term and long term. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks for the question. Um, someone asked me a couple of uh, weeks ago if I was interested in unmanned underwater vehicles, and I said, no, I'm not. I'm obsessed with them. Uh, and that's a fact. Uh, I really do believe that that is an area where we stand to have some of our greatest uh, operational breakthroughs in unmanned underwater vehicles. Uh, last Friday, uh, I was up at Woods Hole looking at some of the work that they're doing there. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've been engaging with, uh, uh, with academia, with, uh, uh, with private industry to go after what is the critical piece in UUVs, and that's power. Uh, we need high-density, shipboard-safe, uh, long-endurance power. And that's, that's where we go. I thought when we started down this path that we could get into, that we could just tap into the scientific community or the oil exploration uh, uh, industry, and that's not the case because they don't stay out very long, and if the weather's bad, they don't go. Uh, and so it really has been kind of a niche for us to drive. I've been very pleased with the response that we have gotten uh, from industry not just the, you know, the, the usual suspects, but there have been some small uh, 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 enterprises that have come forward with some very interesting ideas. Uh, and the uh, applications now are starting to be put in place uh, as far as a uh, sensing system goes, because I think there's huge potential to be able to take these vehicles uh, netted together, as we pr have proven we can do, um, and send them into an area, again, to go into the dull and dangerous, where they can sense the area, and if they see something that we have told them we are interested in, they can let us know about it, and then we can take the steps that we need to do whatever it is that we want to do. The beauty of them also is that you can put them into an area and you can tell them to go to sleep. Um, and wake up when you hear something or wake up when you're stimulated in some way or wake up when we tell you to wake up. Uh, and, and so that's where we're headed. Those are some of the initiatives that we have underway. I would say on both the, the unmanned air and the um, uh, unmanned underwater, uh, a little soapboxing here if I could, uh, the area that really has, has struck me recently is if it is not a system that is currently being procured, there's great aversion to going forth boldly to bring some of these new systems in. Um, we are encumbered by an extraordinary bureaucratic process. 
that is intolerable uh, of failure. Um, and, and, and as a result, we do things and we take steps so that we prolong the process. Uh, we increase the cost accordingly. And I think we're losing uh, some opportunities. Um, the, I think it's a sad statement that uh, it is best to not have something become a program of record if you want it to move quickly. Um, I would also say that I was really quite surprised when we challenged ourselves to have a squadron of unmanned carrier aircraft uh, deployed by 2018, and the, the reaction was, it's too fast. Um, and, and my view, and I've thrown this back, was I can just imagine when Kennedy said uh, that by the end of the decade we'll put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth, somebody said, mm, got to get it through the JSITS process first. Um, you know, I, I really do think that we're kind of losing that sense of, of ambition, of adventure, and reach that really characterized a lot of the great things that we did uh, in the country. And, and I see that in some of these uh, newer technologies that we want to put out there that I think will really make a difference. Uh, and I'm, and I'm uh, hopeful and I'm a great advocate of trying to move to where we can uh, be a little bit more bold in our thinking the application of technology. Some things are going to fail. They're going to fail. Uh, but if you fail early, you learn and you move on. And I think that's been a characteristic that we have had for a long time uh, that, quite frankly, I see slipping away. Uh, I'm going to go in the back here. Thank you, Admiral. Timothy Walton with Delix Consulting Studies and Analysis. Um, I'd love to hear more on your thoughts on Navy strategy, um, first in terms of orientation and then resourcing. On orientation, people say CS21 has been remarkably successful. Uh, however, we may need to shift from a system-centric approach to a more threat-oriented one. And then on resourcing, for the last several decades, we've had a 331 approach in the department. Um, as the Navy looks to the future and as the nation looks to the future, do you think that might change? Well, I think as we, on the latter uh, question, I, I think as you get into uh, the environment in which we're headed, um, we have to look at what is it that you want the various uh, components of the military to be able to do, and, and then uh, how are they resourced ac according to the value that you place on them. Uh, we never have been able to do that, uh, at least in, in my time, uh, but I think that as you get into this uh, environment that we're going to be in, that has to be a discussion that takes place, uh, simply because we're, we're going to be pressed in a lot of areas and we have to put the money where there's the, the best return uh, on, on, on investment. I, I think as a, you know, the comment about the strategy and whether it's threat-based or not, I, I'm very comfortable with how we have looked at it because as you, as you look globally and you see the changes that are taking place, um, the, I, I think we've accounted for that in the context of, of what we believe the, nation, the Navy should be able to do for the nation uh, while we're mindful of, of uh, the things that we're going to encounter. But um, Yes, sir, in the back. I've left you there. Uh, Mike Fabi from Aviation Week. I'd like to follow up on your comments you made regarding the DTG-51 and DTG-1000. What led you to believe that the 51 would be a better ship for BMD than the 1000? And isn't there some concern right now about some requirements creep for the Flight 3 DTGs um, to handle the MDR as it comes online? Yeah. You could remove the Flight 3 DDG and just leave the requirements creep there, and it would apply to everything that we deal with. Uh, I view that as one of the things that I do is, is, uh, is, is to make sure that I police the requirements as they come forward. I think that's one of the areas that we were uh, fairly successful in with regard to littoral combat ship. Uh, when we knew we had to get the price down, uh, when we um, uh, knew that we wanted to get it out and operating, uh, sitting on requirements creep was a high priority. And if you look at the differences that have taken place between the, the subsequent ships that are being built today, the amount of change that's taking place in those ships is really pretty remarkably low. Um, with regard to the DDG-1000, 
and the BMD capability. Uh, we knew we had a winner. We uh, believed uh, and still believe that we can get more out of the radar that exists on the 51. Uh, and then we also have the advantage uh, of not having to have a completely separate missile inventory uh, for a DDG-1000 if we made the significant investments to even take that ship uh, to a BMD ship. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Admiral. Dan Taylor inside the Navy. Uh, the, in the House Appropriations Defense Subcommittee, they have their bill out, and, and there's a lot of language in there about shipbuilding oversight. And they raised a lot of concerns across a number of ship classes. And I know this is something that's come with LPD-17 before, and I know it's something you're looking at. Could you talk about how concerned you are with this uh, question of oversight and, and you know, what you believe needs to be done? I think that, um, that there were some steps taken where we backed away from what, what I would call the basics um, of, of engineering and, uh, and, and oversight. The, uh, there was a time, for example, that all of our ship classes had, a, had, a, had an engineering-based life cycle management system. We walked away from that, and I think that's when you look at some of the readiness issues that that we encountered, and I'm pleased to say we've started to make a turn on those now. Uh, we had walked away from that. We, we just weren't taking, taking care of these uh, fairly significant capital investments that we had. Uh, we also uh, backed away from uh, the organizations and the, and, the, and the Navy oversight that we had in the building yards uh, when, when I think we, we quite frankly, we. Uh, assume too much on the part of the contractor uh, for uh, quality assurance systems, and we we pulled our folks out of the yard, and um, and we paid for it. And so, as part of the the efficiencies that we went through, we have reinstituted the engineered life cycle. We have reinvigorated and remanned uh, the cadre, the the Navy cadre that's on scene in our shipyards to provide that oversight, to provide the, the insight into the practices and the quality. And, and I would also say that it serves to uh, enable the contractor to get a faster response out of the Navy as they're building these great things. They're moving along. They hit a snag. Uh, they now have a more robust organization to say, you know, we need to be able to do this or we need to make this change, and, and I think it can, it can be a good two-way street. And, uh, and, I, and I say that we upped it, and it's not an adversarial, uh, you know, my approach to this is not adversarial. It really is, um, you know, having the eyes on there, having that interaction with the builder so that we can build the best possible ships for the nation. Uh, well, I think I've seen uh, very good progress in the engineered life cycle. I've seen good progress in our trends in what we call our in-service in, in inspections. Um, and so that's positive. Uh, and, and, I, and, and we're seeing the, the quality change, but I think the contractors have also taken what we call a round turn on that. And, and uh, it, you know, this is a team effort. It's a team sport. There's no question about it. So we're moving in the right direction. Uh, needles are starting to move. We need to move a little bit more, but we'll get there. Uh, I'm going to go back here. Ed Maruffet, uh, Sam Feldman hey, from Sam, Navy Times. Excellent. Uh, I have a question about commanding officer and senior officer reliefs. Right. So far this year, we've had 12, and right. a lot of those are for uh, personal misconduct. What's going on behind this trend, and what is the Navy doing about it? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that, uh, one, you've got it right. Uh, most of them are for what I would call character or, or ethical shortcomings. Um, we have um, uh, increased the attention that we pay, particularly when individuals are coming through the command training uh, pipeline. Uh, there are some other things that we are looking at putting in place that give us better insight into the screening process as individuals enter that, uh, that process. Uh, I know the fleet commanders and subordinate commanders are heavily focused on this. Um, but I would submit that the one thing that we're not going to change is the standard that we live to. 
Um, and, and we have relieved several commanding officers because they didn't meet the standard, and that's not going to change. Um, that's, you know, standards are standards because they are. And so uh, we're going to continue to enforce that. Uh, it is an area that, uh, you know, I've talked to some of your colleagues in the press on this before. And, uh, you know, we live in a very different environment today than in the past. No longer do we enjoy the divide between our personal and our professional lives that we used to even 10 years ago. You know, everyone in this room, um, I would say, or at least most people in the room, uh, is a photojournalist. Pull the device out of your pocket and you can record and transmit instantaneously anything that you want to. Um, and I think that's part of it. The other area that I personally have been drawn to is in the way that we tend to uh, live our lives uh, as driven by demands such as uh, uh, you know financial demands, school demands. Uh, today people are getting, you know, perhaps they're a little bit upside down on a mortgage, so when the Navy says, I need you to go to San Diego, and maybe you're living in Washington. Uh, oftentimes, that causes the family to be apart for two or three years. Uh, sometimes that's done in multiple tours. Um, and I think we're beginning to see a little bit of that uh, come into it. But we're continuing to look at it. We're holding our people accountable. And we're looking at gaining better insight into uh, folks as they, as they come along. because. It's always very interesting. Rarely do you encounter a situation like this where someone didn't have some inkling that maybe there was something going on. Uh, you know, the commanding officer that maybe gets a DUI, and then somebody says, yeah, they, you know, he really did like the wine, didn't he? And, you know, and my point is when you, when you have that sense, that's the time to intervene. That's the time to um, come alongside your friend and say, hey, I think, uh, I think we need to talk about something here. And so we're working that piece as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, John Harper with the Asahi Shimbun. Uh, recently, several senators on the Armed Services Committee have said that U.S. basing plans for East Asia and the Western Pacific are unworkable and need to be reexamined. Uh, what is your reaction to that? And are you concerned that for cost cutting or other reasons, uh, the U.S. basing alignment might be altered to the detriment of regional security and national security? Thanks. Um, and I'm, I've been privy to that process since about 1994 now, I think, and uh, watching it come along. Um, I, I think that it, you know, it really is a matter between the United States and Japan. Uh, I think we have a good dialogue going. Um, and, and as we look at force structure writ large, which I think we will do, you know, we're going to have to look at what the laydown is of that force structure. But right now, uh, the plan that we have uh, uh, with the Japanese is the plan that we're going forward with. Admiral you Kyle. already had one. I'm going to take one back here. Okay, and then I'm going to have to cut you off. Cut I'm off. sorry. Okay, good. <laughs> Not good. I could do this all day. Lauren. <laughs> Admiral Bill Burns from uh, Institute for Defense Analysis. You mentioned, uh, first of all, uh, the strategy being global and forward presence. And you also mentioned the fact that the Navy is at its smallest since 1916. Uh, the last shipbuilding plan I saw was from last year. I don't know if the, there's one out this year. But it showed the number of ships going up here for the next few years. But then in the late 20s, a nosedive, particularly for attack submarines and large surface combatants, where uh, how do you maintain a strategy without the ships, I guess, is the question. Do you have a, a, a view on how to fix the numbers problem? Yeah. Thanks for the question. It was the perfect final question, <laughs> I might add. Um, the, uh, you know, I Good often choosing. say that one of the biggest challenges that we face um, is the decade of the 20s. It really is. Uh, because as you pointed out, that's when we see the aging out of, of the ships that were built in the 80s. Uh, where we were building five and six of a particular class. Uh, so that really has inflated, but they all come to the, to the cliff at about the same time. Um, so we have to deal with that. Uh, we are also, at that point, beginning to recapitalize the strategic deterrent, uh, which I would argue is the most survivable of the three legs of the deterrent. And I think that 
that that is of great national import. So we're doing that. We are also in the process of uh, refueling the Nimitz class carriers. Uh, not an insignificant cost, but you have to do that to get the 50 years of life uh, out of the ships. And then in the 20s, for the first time, we begin the process of decommissioning the Nimitz class aircraft carriers. So I look around at some former naval officers here, and that's just a sign of our age that, uh, that these babies are going away. Um, but that really puts a burden on it. And, 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 and even though we tend to focus in Washington on uh, you know, what will be happening in the next couple of months, I think nationally we have to look at what type of a Navy do we want, where do we want it to be, what areas of the world are of greatest interest to us, what's the type of fleet we have, and we have to do that uh, eyes wide open about what's going to happen in the 20s. And so, you know, we have laid in, as you said, we've laid in some good lines that uh, will give us what we believe the types of ships that we need to perform that range of missions uh, that I talked about. Uh, but there are some that will age out that we will have to, uh, have to come to grips with. What's the replacement? What are, what's the technology that we'll be up against at that point in time? Um, in the case of, for example, submarines, I think that you can, you can if, you, if you make the right decisions on unmanned underwater systems, um, that can be hugely uh, beneficial uh, and can perhaps absorb a smaller force structure. But we have to be willing to be bold in how we, how we move into that, into that realm. Uh, in the case of the, the replacement for the guided missile destroyers, uh, which tend to be the workhorse uh, that we use, and you know, people will argue, why do you, why do you use a uh, guided missile destroyer to you know, rescue Captain Phillips of the Maersk, Alabama? Um, I think that's a pretty good stretch of the capability, quite frankly. Um, and, and we also have to keep in mind that as a maritime nation with two great oceans to cross, you can't do it in a rowboat. So there has to be some size and some robustness to the types of ships that we build. And, and in the next year or two is when we will we'll have to really dig in and start thinking about what that element is going to be. But I think most of the other lines are, are good to carry us through the 20s. And then it's just a question of how the nation wants to resource it. Admiral, thank you so much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thanks to all of you for coming and making the time as well. And uh, we look forward to having you back in the future. Take care.